Good morning, family. Good morning. Pastor Don has asked me to read uh, the passage of Scripture, um, picking up where we had left off last week. So it's Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. If you care to go there in your Bible. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming dots of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying at all times in spirit with all prayer in supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. If you would bow your heads with me in prayer as we go to the throne. Father God, we do give you thanks and praise for this day that you have given us, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together here as your people, the sheep of your flock. We thank you. We know that you are holy, Lord, and that there is none like you. You have no rivals, you have no equal. So we come, Lord, we bow our heads and our hearts now. We pray that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word, Lord. We thank you, we worship and praise you in the name, the mighty and matchless name of our Savior, our King, Lord Jesus. Let all God's people say, Amen. One of the most sobering facts about life is that all human beings have a supernatural enemy whose aim is to use pain and pleasure to make us blind and foolish and miserable forever. The devil, Satan, is the enemy of the Christian's soul who masquerades as an angel of light. He is described in scripture as the deceiver of the whole world. 
the accuser, the ruler of this world, the God, small g, of this age. Ironically, the, the, the devil is a created being who was first an angel in heaven. However, this angel wanted to be God. It says in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and following, in regards to Satan, the prophet writes, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the, the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to show to the far reaches of the pit. Paul reminded us back in chapter 2 here in our letter that those who are separated from Jesus, they follow this devil, this prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons or daughters of disobedience, among whom, Paul writes, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Fortunately, God rules sovereignly over Satan, our enemy. The devil does not have a free hand in this world. He is on a leash so that he can do no more than God permits. However, he will work hard and long and consistently at crushing you and defeating you and destroying you if you choose to not follow the principles that God lays out for us here in his word. Be reminded that in John chapter 10, the scripture says this about our enemy. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus then says, but I have come that you might have life and have it in all of its fullness. We have darkness, and we have the light. Satan embezzles, murders, and breaks. Jesus freely gives deep-seated fulfillment satisfaction to our lives if we will receive his truth and believe his truth. Before we look at several ways that the devil seeks to destroy us, I just want to draw your attention to a phrase that I think will act like a ballast, a, a stabilizer 
as we think about being a follower of Jesus and at the same time a soldier in a spiritual war as this Jesus follower. Paul says here that there are a number of things that we will need to wear in our lives if we are going to win this battle. And interestingly, one of those items that's mentioned there in verse 15 is that of spiritual shoes. And Paul is metaphorically saying that our spiritual shoes represent this gospel of peace. The gospel that we have as followers of Jesus is the good news, the, the good news that God has purchased peace for us by the death of his son, and he offers this peace to us as sinners if we would but receive the gift of Jesus that we can attain by faith alone. In Jesus, the interior place of spiritual hostility in my heart becomes peace filled when Jesus enters in. And there is nothing sweeter in all the world than to be at peace with God. Do you believe that this morning? That should rattle our souls. That should change the direction of every one of our lives. That Jesus Christ has purchased peace for us. That he went to the cross and absorbed the wrath, the anger of God the Father so that you and I could be at peace with our Creator. There is nothing sweeter in all of the world than to be at peace with God. You see, the only reason that there is any conflict going on here, the only reason that, that Paul even has to bring this up here in this letter is because the power of sin and the power of Satan are dead set against you being at peace with God. He doesn't like it. If we go back to, again, chapter 2, verse 13, we see how this, go this gospel develops in us this inner peace because Paul said back then but now in Christ Jesus you who were once far off separated chasm between you you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down the dividing wall of hostility, and reconciled us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby bringing the hostility to an end. There is no better news than what's right there for us. The good news of peace is that when Christ died and shed his blood on the cross for sin, the hostility, the enmity between us and God was now overcome. Jesus was victorious. Death 
could not hold him down. And so now Paul says in our text this morning, because you are at peace with God, as followers, as children of Christ, understand that, that you have an enemy who is going to do all he can to get you back into his family. And it's for this reason that Paul begins this final section by saying here, as Cedric read, finally, finally, we're at the end of the letter. I've tried to build you up, Paul says. I, I, I've tried to give you the, the basis of why Jesus is the way to the Father. And I've tried to walk with you and make application by the words that I've spoken to you in this letter. But finally, let me just say this, Paul says, you be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. You see, the, the, the kind of battle that we as followers of Jesus fight, this battle can never be won apart from our Messiah and the truth that he upholds. The weapons needed to do battle with him are not found deep down inside of our own resolve. They're not found in the velocity of our voice. They're not found by just in our own power thinking that we can just rebuke off these evil spirits. Paul reminds us to be strong in the Lord. To be strong in His might. Now there are many ways that, that Satan will seek to, to do battle with us. This is why in verse 11 in our text it says to put on the whole armor of God which we'll look at next week that you may that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil another word for schemes there in the Greek is strategies you see that the devil has this arsenal of weapons he is a he, he has a portfolio of tactics and approaches that that he longs to use to draw us away from the path that leads to eternal life. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 to not be unaware of the devil's devices. This morning let me just paint for you a picture of three of the most common strategies that, that the devil will use to, to get us off track. Number one, Satan seeks to destroy you by speaking lies to you in this cloud of deceitfulness. Jesus said when the, when the devil, when he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. A, a, a lie is when a truth is replaced by an untruth. I don't know about you, but I don't like being lied to. A lie is when a truth is replaced by something that is not a truth. And so a lie fairly uh, com comes out as a, a standalone untruth. In other words, 
most often, if I want to lie to you, I'm going to do so by hiding or cushioning that lie in a cloud of deception. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, the, the first time that Satan appears in the Bible. The, the first words on his lips are those of being suspicious of the truth. Did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? In other words, there's a lie in there, right? What he's saying, there's a lie inside, but it's questioned by deception. And that's why the scripture says that Satan comes as an angel of light. He wants you to kind of second guess truth. The second words on Satan's lips here in Genesis were a subtle falsehood. You're not going to die. You, you will not die. You see, the Apostle John reminds us that Satan has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him, as John 8, 44 tells us. When you are tempted to do wrong, to do what you know in your heart is not right, because the Holy Spirit, who dwells in us as followers of Jesus, the Holy Spirit speaks through our consciences, speaks through our hearts, through our minds. And so when you're tempted to do what is wrong and you know deep inside in your mind that it is wrong, when that enticement comes, you need to understand that Satan is seeking to take you back into this world of deception and falsehood and untruth. Slowly, steadily, but strongly. Someone once said the devil doesn't come dressed in a red cape and pointy horns. He comes as everything you've ever wished for. Some of you right now are quite possibly living in environments of disobedience and sin and so guilt and shame, it, it kind of just is swirling around you because you know deep inside that you have fallen prey to deception. You've fallen prey to falsehood, to unbelief. And God calls us to repent daily, to, to make these decisive changes in the direction that we're walking, the directions that we're following, and living in known sin is really just choosing to live in Satan's prison. It says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So you, you don't have to live in this environment of despair or depression, or shame, or guilt that is due to this sin that you've clung to, you can cry out to Jesus and ask him to break that chain that's holding your heart in, in hostage, in a hostage position. Jesus, I can't find the strength in and of myself to be free from this sin that I've 
fallen in love with, but I know that, that you do have the power. And so I pray that you would come and break this chain and give me this truth, this promise to hold on to so that I can be set free and bring glory to your name. That's what repentance looks like. And in five minutes, you might have to go back and pray that same prayer again. But you see, Jesus looks at your heart. And if he knows that you want to release this weight that's in your soul and be free from this deception and this lie, he will set you free. Secondly, Satan schemes to, to, to blind us from the true treasure of life, which is Jesus himself. In Corinthians, Paul reminds us that the God of this age, meaning the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And so the devil not only speaks what is false, he tries hiding from us what is true. And in doing this, he keeps us from seeing the treasure of the gospel of Jesus. How does that go forward? What does that look like? Well, I think sometimes... Satan works really hard at keeping us at this intellectual level with truth. And so my relationship with Jesus is based on facts. I believe that this is the, the word of God. But my relationship with Christ is, is just mechanical. It's duty-driven rather than joyfully life-transforming. And so some of us have convinced ourselves that, yes, Jesus is the treasure, but we carry on with the things of this world. One foot with Jesus and one foot with the flesh. And so the treasure of the glory of Jesus is mixed now with the treasure of things or relationships or emotional highs or intellect, intellectual facts. And there is no there is no love relationship between you and Jesus. It's a little of Jesus and a little of what I want, of what I think is best. And so I come to realize that Satan loves to offer me this mixed cocktail of religion and worldly things. Making those things look like the perfect treasure, or at least part of the perfect treasure, but they're not. Because things fade and rust and rot. Percy Shelley once said, sometimes the devil is a gentleman. That's very true. Thirdly, Satan tempts people to sin. This is what he did unsuccessfully to Jesus in the wilderness. He wanted him to abandon the, the, the path of obedience and the path of suffering and rather follow this master of disobedience. 
And this is what he did successfully to Judas in the last hours of Jesus' life. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul warns against this for all of us as believers. He says there, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, in other words, by his sneakiness, by his craftiness, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Do you understand that, that Satan right now is seeking to get into your mind and to get you to believe his lie so that you will slowly but eventually walk away from your devotion to Jesus. Again, he's not going to come before you like one dressed in a red robe with horns and you just, oh, this is Satan, I'm not going to get involved with that. No, there's deceitfulness and there's subtlety behind his scheming. Charles Spurgeon once said, Satan can make men dance upon the brink of hell as though they were on the verge of heaven. Understand that the path to our victory in this warfare is to hold on and to cling and to rest in the arms of Jesus who has already dealt the decisive blow. 1 John 3, 8 says, the Son of God, Jesus, the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Colossians 2, 15, one of my favorite verses. God disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in him. In other words, the decisive blow was struck at Calvary. And Jesus took that for us. And so the question this morning is not whether you want to be in this war. Everyone is in it. Either we are defeated by the devil and thus following like cattle to the slaughter, the prince of the power of the air, or we are resisting this devil through faith in Jesus and his truth, and we're treasuring the glory of that truth above the evil that sits before us in this world. Peter said, resist him in your faith. Resist him and he will flee from you. But there is no neutral zone, my friends. Corey Ten Boom once said that the first step on the way to victory is to recognize the enemy. And that's my prayer this morning, that as we soak ourselves in the truth of Scripture, and as we soak ourselves in the realities of who our enemy really is, 
My prayer is that each one of us will recognize the deceitfulness, the subtlety, the untruths that he lays before us. It's just this one time. It's just this one look. It's just this one purchase. It's just this one night. My prayer is that we will recognize that Satan is our enemy, the enemy of our soul. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer this morning? Father, only you can change the interior of our hearts. Only, only you can break the hardness of our flesh. Only you can open our spiritual eyes so that we will savor the beauty of your Son, Jesus. Only you can grant us the faith that's needed to put our trust in the Savior for the forgiveness of all our sin. And Lord, this morning we come boldly into the throne room of grace and pray that Lord God you would begin that work in those of us here this morning that are really not in a relationship with you we might be into religion we might be into doing good so that you might like us but God, we know from your truth the only hope we have is to put our faith in what Jesus has done on our behalf. And only you can give us that understanding and that belief. And so, Lord, I pray on behalf of those that might be here this morning that sit in darkness. Lord, I pray for those who have made that transition because of your gift of grace and your gift of faith and those who have placed their trust in you, but maybe, Lord, have in one way or another turned aside and given in to the deceit of sin, thinking that what we're involved in at least a part of it will bring us satisfaction and happiness. It will build us up. Lord, would you this morning, by the work of your Spirit, remind us that you alone, Jesus, long to be the treasure of our life. And as we commit ourselves to you, your word tells us that you will not just give us life, but that you'll give it to us more abundantly. And God, we know that that's what our souls are longing for. Abundant life. And so God, I pray that you would do what only you can do. But Lord, this week you would go before us. You would speak to our hearts through your truth. And that Lord, you would keep us firmly planted in the soil of that truth that you've given to us for our freedom. And this we pray in the powerful name of Jesus.